Hi guys, this is an earth science review called top 10 things to know for the regents exam. So I wanted to pick out, you know, the things that are going to pop up the most on the exam, things that you'll see pretty much every single school year. Uh, and I want to make sure that you guys understand these things in preparation for tomorrow's exam. So let's take a look at the top 10, what I think are the things to know for the regents. Number one, uh, we're going to be looking at Polaris and latitude. And if you look at this list, I tried to pick out some things from the entire school year, pretty much most of the units that we covered on different subjects. So I'm going to go through all of these individually, starting with number one, Polaris equals latitude. So Polaris, as you know, is the North Star. Every single star in the night sky will appear to revolve around it. And that's because the Earth is rotating on its axis every 24 hours, once every 24 hours. Now remember, Polaris, because it's called the North Star, is only visible in the Northern Hemisphere. And the most important thing I would say is the fact that the angle above the ground, or the altitude we call it of Polaris, above the horizon is your latitude. So if you're standing at the North Pole, you'll see Polaris straight above you, or at the zenith, 90 degrees above the horizon. If you're in Syracuse, then the latitude is 43 degrees north, and that means Polaris will be 43 degrees above the horizon. So just a reminder that Polaris is a really good indicator of your latitude. Okay, and you're probably going to see something about that on the test. Number two, Earth spins on its axis or rotates at a rate of 15 degrees per hour. And that's kind of related to what we just talked about. If you spin once, that's 360 degrees. In one day or 24 hours, if you do the math, that's 15 degrees per hour. And therefore, you're going to see things appear to move across the sky at that same rotation rate. Just like all the stars going around Polaris, the sun will go across the sky at that rate too. That's also important for time zones. Remember that time zones are divided into a total of 24 of them across the globe, and they're all separated by about 15 degrees of latitude. And one other reminder, if you're trying to figure out time in time zones, if you go east, the time's gonna increase, and if you go west, the time will be less. So look for time zones and also look for that rotation rate because that's probably going to pop up. Number three, going into a little bit of geology. Remember that rocks are classified based upon how they are formed, and that's called their origin. This is something you can definitely look for on pages six and seven of your reference table. So you use that as a handy guide for rocks. But also notice the rock cycle chart on page six kind of gives you an indication of how the rocks, the different types of rocks, are formed. Sedimentary rocks are formed by compaction and cementation. Igneous rocks are formed by melting and solidification. And metamorphic rocks are formed by heat and or pressure. And so just be aware, those, those words that are associated with those different rock types are probably going to pop up and something's going to be asked about them. Okay. Number four, seismic waves. These are earthquake waves, right? Waves that are generated by an earthquake. And remember that we can determine a lot of things from seismic waves. First, we can definitely analyze the interior of the earth. It's almost like getting an X-ray scan of the interior of the earth. We can determine how fast the waves are moving, whether they're moving through material or not. And so we can kind of get a picture of the earth's interior and that's on page 10 of the reference table. Another thing to notice or know about seismic waves are that P waves, are the faster ones. They always arrive first, they're the primary wave, and S waves are slower and they always arrive second. And from those two waves, we can determine a lot. We can determine how far away the earthquake occurred and we can figure out what time an earthquake occurred. And that's all based upon reference table page 11. One thing to remember about uh, reference table page 11, determining distance is based upon the lag time. In other words, when did the P wave arrive and when did the S wave arrive? And if you subtract those two numbers, you're going to get a time difference that you can use in what's called the wedge method to determine the distance to the epicenter. And if you have any questions about that, you can see some of my other videos on seismic waves. Okay, so remember seismic waves are important for not only determining the interior of the earth, but also determining things about an earthquake. Number five, abrasion. This is a word that often pops up and it's something you definitely should know about. Weathering and erosion was a major unit that we covered. 
And abrasion is a major method of breaking down rocks uh, in the process of transport. So remember, weathering is all about breaking down the rock and erosion is all about the transport. And there are different ways of doing that that we've, we've discussed. But also remember that abrasion is the process by which rocks become rounded and smaller as they bump into each other and collide with each other. The edges, the sharp edges seem to get rounded off. And so it makes nice smooth rocks, which you often find in streams. And so abrasion might be one of those words that pops up uh, in relation to stream transport, weathering and erosion. Number six, meanders. You're probably gonna see something about stream meanders. You're gonna see a river, or you're gonna see a stream, a picture of one, and it's going to ask you about the, the velocity or the depth or where's the erosion or deposition taking place. So just remember that the water velocity is always faster along the outside of the curve kind of like the end of a baseball bat is faster than the hands of the, of the person swinging. So the outside curve is faster and therefore because that's faster, that's where erosion is going to take place. And because erosion happens on the outside of the curve, it's always going to be deeper on the outside of the curve. The lower velocity side will be on the inside of the curve and that's where deposition is going to take place and that's where it's gonna be more shallow and you'll see like a point bar uh, on the inside curve, whereas on the outside curve, you're going to see like a cut bank. It's going to be a lot steeper there. And so one thing you're probably going to have to do or maybe have to answer a question about is what does it look like from a profile view, from a side view? This Remember, the deeper side is the outside of the curve because it's faster. OK, so you're going to have to draw a profile or answer questions related to stream meanders. Number seven related to meteorology, high versus low pressure. And this is something you can definitely look at on page 14 of your reference table. There is a chart related to the wind belts of the earth, but there's definitely going to be questions asked about what is it like in a low pressure system? A low pressure system you can associate with lousy weather. Remember low equals lousy. And by lousy, what I mean is storms, rain, clouds, kind of drizzly weather. So all of your storms are associated with that and your weather fronts are often associated with that low pressure. And that's because all the air is converging. It's coming into the low. Remember, air wants to flow from high to low pressure. So all this air is converging. And as it converges, it's going to rise. And as it rises, it's also rotating counterclockwise in the Northern hemisphere. So all of those things you're gonna have to kind of associate with low pressure, lousy weather, rain, convergent wind, counterclockwise, and rising. High pressure is the exact opposite. So high pressure means that the air is sinking back down again and diverging. Remember high diverge and low converge. So diverging wind, rotating clockwise, and high pressure is always associated with sunny skies. So clear, no clouds whatsoever. Okay, so note the difference between high versus low pressure. Those are kind of things you're just gonna have to memorize. Number eight, kind of related to the previous one, the orographic effect often pops up on the Regents exam. And this is something that you might learn about in global studies, but also remember that this is a climate type of question related to all the different factors that affect the climate. So a lot of different things like how far away are you from the ocean or what is the elevation of your location or what is your latitude and all of those factors affect it. But what we're talking about here is how a mountain affects the climate. So different sides of the mountain. One side is called the windward side. That would be the side where the air is coming from, maybe coming off of the ocean. And as that air is lifted over the mountains, it's rising up. And as it rises up, it's going to cool down and become a lower pressure. And because of that, all that air, because it's cooling of the water that's in it is going to condense and you're going to form clouds. And as a result of forming clouds, you're going to have much rainier weather and cooler weather. And it might be more like a rainforest-like condition uh, on the windward side of the mountains. Very rainy, kind of like Seattle, Washington. The leeward side is on the opposite side of the mountain. As the air comes back down again and descends down the mountain, it's going to warm up and dry out, and you're going to have more sunny conditions on that side and therefore 
it's going to be more desert-like on the leeward side. So definitely know the difference between the windward and the leeward side and associate that with climate. Number nine, phases of the moon. I pretty much guarantee there's going to be questions about the phases of the moon in some way. There's all different types of questions that can be asked. One thing that you're definitely gonna wanna note is the fact that we always see the same side of the moon. And that's due to the fact that the earth is going to rotate at the same time or the same rate at which it revolves, 27.3 days for both of those. So we always see the same side of the moon. Another thing that you're gonna wanna know is the fact that as the moon revolves around the earth, it's reflecting sunlight. And so we always see different phases of the moon from day to day to day. Now, one thing that's also important is the fact that in order to go from a major phase to the next major phase, it takes 29 and a half days. So I always say 29 and a half days from phase to phase. So if you wanna go from the full moon, which by the way is tomorrow, June 24th, to the next full moon, it's going to be 29 and a half days later. So you can answer questions related to a calendar. If you wanna go from full moon to the next phase, which would be the last quarter, it's gonna be about a week or so, okay? So be able to answer questions related to time and time differences between phases. And also another thing to take note of is the fact that um, major phases like the new moon and the full moon indicate a, a possible time when you can have an eclipse. So just recently we, we had a solar eclipse that was on the new moon. If you have a lunar eclipse, that happens during a full moon. So be able to answer questions related to diagrams related to the phases of the moon and be able to draw the different phases of the moon at different positions. Okay, so definitely gonna see questions related to phases. Number 10, finally, one thing that you're probably gonna have to answer a question about is why do we have seasons? And one thing to remember, it's all about the tilt of the earth. It has nothing to do with our distance away from the sun. It's all about how the earth is tilted on its axis at an angle of 23 and a half degrees. And remember, the Northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun on June 21st. That's our full tilt towards the sun. And that means that day has the highest angle of insulation for the Northern hemisphere, which means we have more direct sunlight, which means the temperatures are going to be warmer. In Winter, December 21st, the Northern Hemisphere, the North Pole is tilted away from the sun. Therefore, the sun is lower in the sky. It's at a lower angle of insulation and we get less direct sunlight and shorter daylight hours. And so remember, the reason for the seasons is all about tilt. And so you're probably gonna see some questions related to that as well. Okay, so that's all top 10. Um, remember the regents will be at 8.30 a.m. Definitely get there early and some reminders to, to bring pens and pencils and a basic calculator, just a simple calculator that can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. You're gonna need that maybe for a few questions during the test. Pens are probably most important because all of the tests will pretty much be done in pen, including your bubble sheet. The only way that you can use a pencil is for any diagrams or graphs that you might have during the test. Okay, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email is there and you can always follow me on YouTube as well as on Instagram at Roboto Science. All right, good luck and I'll see you guys tomorrow.